there was such an opportunity to declare what I feel about this man that I essentially changed my travel plans, thinking that I would be able to sort of elucidate the relationship that I had with him, what I learned from him about sports and life. But just listening to the words that have been spoken ahead of me, watching the videos that we have watched, I, I fear that I might not make it through. But nevertheless, we've been given a few minutes to talk about a man who was very peculiar, very unique, very distinctive, and as we've heard this evening, extremely distinguished. This is a gentleman par excellence. We've heard this phrase already today. Indeed, when I heard that I had four minutes to speak about him, I, in the words of a dear friend of mine, thought it was a bit of a joke, because this is a man that I could speak about continuously for 24 hours and more. But I'm praying that you will bear with me as an audience. Um, Professor John Evans Atamills, prof as we called him. My first recollection of meeting him was right on this campus. My father worked on this university campus. And as an early adolescent, I must have been 11 or 12 when he moved next door to us. And um, our homes, well, my parents' homes and his and Auntie Nadu's homes were about 70 meters apart. And so every evening, he and my father had gelled in the sense that my father was a tax historian and Professor Mills was a tax lawyer, essentially. It was 16 years between my father and him and 16 years between him and I. And literally three or four evenings a week, him and my father would be discussing things on our back stoop or on his back stoop, like I said, 70 meters away. And I had the benefit of sitting at the feet of these two men who were very similar in terms of their principles and their views about right and wrong and their love for sport. It wasn't long thereafter when Professor Mills and I ended up playing on the same hockey team. And initially it was the OAA, the old Achimutans um, hockey team, and then we both became veterans, and this was when I was about 17. <laughs> yeah, I aged very quickly. <laughs> yeah. But he became my ride, my vehicle of opportunity to the national hockey pitch or to the 37 hockey pitch when there was one or wherever else we were supposed to be training that week. And what I learned from those twice, maybe sometimes thrice a week trips was an opportunity to sit at his feet and learn from his wisdom, from his articulation of what we should be doing as people, as students, as men and women, as Ghanaians, what we should be doing to make sure that our country went right. After hockey matches or after hockey practice, we would start that trip. Um, that went either to Dansoman or to Medina, where he would visit family and he would impart his knowledge and advice and wisdom on things. And I happened to tag along and hear all of these things. By the time I was 18 or 19 at the, at the University of Ghana, Professor Mills was the head of the Amalgamated Clubs. That's the uh, body that oversees sport in the university. And so in that sense, he was my boss, he was my manager, he was the one who decided what we did, where we traveled, how we should behave, and what discipline should be inflicted when at that age we misbehaved. And again, it was quite an wonderful opportunity to get mentored by a man whose principles have been spoken about today in ways that um, I'm not sure I could speak about anybody else that I know. Prof was a stalwart in ensuring that things went the way they should. 
and when my mother passed, my sorry, my father passed away, my mother just passed, when my father passed away, Prof became an executor of my father's will and ensured that um, my mother was taken care of the way that she was supposed to be. At the end of 1980, um, this was in the era where universities were closing, there was a lot of disruption because of um, the coup situation. I had got an opportunity to take a scholarship, and an athletic scholarship, and go to the United States. And I wanted to stay in Ghana. And it was Professor Mills who essentially talked me into seeing the wisdom of using this opportunity to develop aspects of your person that then can help you make a contribution later in life. Sports was truly a big part of who he was, but what I wanted to say today in principle was that for him, sports was a vehicle for men Entering youth, making sure that youth developed in ways that they were supposed to, ways that would help their families and their country benefit. Um, and so he recognized the platform that sport provided to improve people's discipline, their leadership abilities, the excellence that you strive for when you're trying to become a champion. He recognized the self-confidence that came from participating in sports, the teamwork that committing to a team in sports brought about. Fair play has already been mentioned today. Playing by the rules was integral to understanding how we work within the rubric of structures that are national or regional or university-wide, goal setting, hard work, the pain and sweat and toil that you go through to try to become a champion, and perhaps most important of all, he told me, was learning how to lose. Because if you learn how to lose in any aspect of your life, and it's something that happens very frequently in sport, if you've played sport as much as if you've played sport as much as I have, you've probably lost at least a million times across the various sports that you play. And what it does is it teaches you that losing isn't the end of the world. Losing simply takes you back to the place where back to the place where you have to try and understand what you didn't do appropriately, restructure, and get back into the game. And so when you see our Black Stars players, and I'm sorry to bring this up since they've just come back home, but when you see them shaking hands with the Comoros Islands uh, players, recognize that even though they do not look unhappy, as unhappy as we spectators, they are unhappy, but they're so used to losing that they don't express their unhappiness and I know that didn't come out the way I meant it. I know it didn't come out the way I meant it. But they're so used to it that they don't express their, their unhappiness with losing by burying themselves in a sorrowful mood. The very next minute, they're already thinking about, congratulations, but the next time we, we, meet, we meet, I'm going to beat you. That's what you learn from losing that much in sport. I remember when the under 20 soccer team, our national team, actually went out and won the World Cup in, I believe, it was 2009. Now, when Prof was talking to us about the kinds of rewards that we give to our teams that excel, one of the points he made was that it was very critical that when you are rewarding people who are that age, 20 and below, you think about what's going to happen to them in the future. And a significant part of the bonus that he gave them was this investment bonds that he made us open for them for their futures. So for Prof, sports was a perfect vehicle for mentoring people in that he recognized it as a platform on which youth could enhance their life chances, that the lessons that they learn through sport translate into life productivity and into success in professions, even beyond simply getting a job at SEPS or in the police services or anywhere else. I've been told I had five minutes. So in wrapping up, I wanted to share 10 of the life lessons that I learned through sport from Professor Mills. 
The first one was that we needed to think of ways to lift up our youth to help them get a real chance to succeed in life. And like I said, sport was a platform that lent itself so easily to that. But Prof's concern was mainly that for those of us who have children at home, we do everything, we sacrifice everything to make sure that our children get further than we do. And yet, when we have children at work, for example, if we are lecturers and we have children like students under us, it's not necessarily the same attitude that we take. In a lot of instances, we actually try to suppress them and make them work much harder than we make our own children work at home. And so for him, it was important that we try to ensure that the children that we come into contact with in our classrooms and on our sports teams and whatnot have the same understanding about the needs that we gave our own children at home. The second one was about excellence, perfection. You come into sport, and he used to say that if you ever went into a game where you didn't think you could win, it was time to leave the sport. You had to try to win every single game fairly, properly, legally, but you had to try to win every single game. And it's this quest for excellence, this quest for success, was even more important than the winning itself. Once he equated it to sin, we've heard about his faith, and he told me that, you know, in this world, there was only one sinless man. We all know that we cannot be perfect, but the most important thing is that every single minute of our lives, we really needed to be striving to be perfect. Then there was a service to country, community, to our societies. He, the way I understood it from him, this was our reason for being and we were to serve, even as leaders. We were to serve in honesty, in truth, and integrity. The fourth point that I wanted to touch on was one that has been broadcast today. It was the one about humility. Consummate Prof. He told me that we are all God's children, and the fact that you're a better hockey player, a better football player, Indeed, even a Hearts of Folk fan. That was one of the things that him and I disagreed on. But hey, um, yeah, fabulous Asante Kotoko. Yeah, so, so Prof and I disagreed on that. But the point that he always made was that even if you are a better football player, a better mathematician, it didn't make you a better human being, a better person than the one you were in front of. And so it was important that we respect people, that we be humble, humble enough to listen to what people have to say. Because like he said, if you listened hard enough and the person made no sense, you lost nothing but five or 10 or 20 minutes of your life. But you never knew what you might gain from just listening to the person. Plus he also told me that if you dress humbly, a lot of times you get to see a person for who they really are before they know who you are. And I'm sure many of us have walked into spaces where we weren't dressed as people expect us to be dressed and people have shown their true colors to us before they realized who we actually were. He had a disgust for cheating. He had an abhorrence for corruption. He said, bar none, it was what we needed to clean up in our country if we wanted to move Ghana forward. And so even for those of us who believe in private enterprise, I got to the point where I started to understand that I can be simultaneously a capitalist and a socialist, and there was no contradiction. The difference was where the money came from. If I was ever given a pot of money that was for a country, a team, uh, a region, a community, by definition, I had to be a socialist. I had to think about equity. I had to think about fairness and so on and so forth. So there was no contradiction there. And related to that was the issue of conflict of interest. He saw it as the easiest way to get tripped up in the whole corruption shenanigans. My first lesson, 
didn't involve prof, but he explained it to me later on. My first lesson was when I was 18 and my admissions file percolated to the top of the admissions list of the University of Ghana. And my father, who was at the registry at that point, basically got up and recused himself. As the University of Ghana is a social institution like many others, the rumor trickled out of that admissions room, got to my mother, got to me about how my father had basically uh, compromised me by making sure he was not there when a decision was being made about my file. And of course, when we went to hockey, I mentioned it to Prof Mills unhappily, and what he told me was, simple question, would you have been happy if you got in and found out that you didn't get in on your own steam. In other words, it was your father's presence that got you in. And I reflected on that for a moment and I thought, mm, maybe he's right. But that was Professor Mills. Being able to, like my immediate predecessor said, break things down very, very simply for all of us to understand. Of course, I got home and I apologized to my father. Bear with me, there are just three more. One of them was fearlessness. Prof basically taught us that what you had to do, you had to do. And you had to be fearless. You had to do it regardless of the consequences. He also taught us that people may not like you if you do the right thing. But guess what? They will respect you. They may not tell you to your face, So do the right thing, no matter what the cost is. Ultimately, I think we all know that Prof's faith and his belief in God were everything to him. That is something that some of us are still trying to learn, and our mission is to try to get even more people to, to learn that. Final, well, no. <laughs> Number nine, suffering. He taught us that suffering is an obligation. He took me once to Philippians 1.29 where we learn that suffering is a responsibility, it's an obligation, it's not simply something that we are going to encounter. And so he said, Padigo, if it ever comes to the point where you think you are being unfairly treated and you are suffering, take that as a badge of honor, take that as an opportunity to do what your God wants you to do. Because Philippians 1.29 tells us that it is incumbent on us to suffer for our faith. So I still remember Prof in his office lamenting, saying, ah, Padigo, what's the maya on dinner? And I still remember the pain. But even that was teaching, even that was mentoring, even that was an opportunity to help us learn because subsequently, any time that I've gone through any of the things that we've gone through, and I'm, I know everybody has gone through things, but hey, I could mention the Martha Bisa issue and whatnot. I always remember that, hey, look, I served under somebody who suffered even more than I do. So who am I um, to complain about what you're going through? Finally, he taught us that leadership and service were obligations. He said there were three basic rules when you were a leader. The first one was that, you had to let people recognize that you were in the leadership position, not for your own personal good. You weren't there to self-aggrandize or anything of that sort. Second of all, he said you had to let the people who you were trying to lead recognize that you treated them equally and fairly. And thirdly, he had to, you had to let them know that you would go to bat for them if they did the right things. Even if people were against them, you would stand up for them. And he convinced me that if you did these three things, made sure that the people that you are leading believe these three things, they would do anything for you. And I saw people do things for Prof that were amazing. So if you are a leader, if things need to be fixed, your job was to fix them or die trying to fix them. And that's what Prof did. He died. He answered the call. 
He stood up to lead, and he led as both a president and as a priest. Again, you can go to Zechariah 6 and read verses 12 and 13, and you will see the role that Prof had, both as a leader and as a priest. No surprise that the first month he was in office, there were complaints about him turning the castle into a prayer camp or something of that sort. So that was Prof. That's what I learned from him. I loved him. I miss him. I'm proud to speak about him. I thank the organizers for inviting me. When he passed, we used to say, Sasa. But I'm hoping that today, there is a rebirth. God rest Prof. So. God lift high his legacy. And God bless our one and only Ghana. Thank you.